When historians look back on the war between Russia and Ukraine, once it's over and all wars eventually end, I believe it's pretty strong likelihood that they're going to view this as the terminal phase of the end of the war. We are now approaching what I believe is going to be the end game in the war. Now, some people may say, oh, well, that's not the case. There's always a chance that Ukraine can, can turn things around. I mean, we, we always see the underdogs sometimes come back. As a matter of fact, some people are pointing to uh, an, an approach uh, across the Dnipro River in the Kherson area where Ukraine has, has genuinely made some advances. They have crossed over the river. They've established a beachhead up to five kilometers deep and, and a number of kilometers wide. And many people are saying, see, they're actually making progress now. And Russia's having to rush in some defenses. Look, let me just tell you, just categorically, militarily, it's inconsequential to the point that it has it makes no difference at all. And in fact, it, it it anguishes me to know that the Ukraine troops are fighting and dying over this muddy terrain around this river for no purpose at all. It doesn't matter that they've been successful. And here's the reason why. You don't have to be a military expert to understand this. Just know what you've seen. On June the 5th of this past year, uh, of this year, when the Ukraine side launched its its long anticipated offensive, it went nowhere. We've of course we've diagrammed that on previous deep dive episodes. You can go back and watch them. But just watching the headlines, you know that it went nowhere. They didn't barely scratch the surface of it. And the reasons why were were laid out very graphically in that Ukraine entered this combat with insufficient air power, almost almost no offensive air power hardly any tactical air defense systems. They had them all like in Kiev and some of the major areas deeper in the country. They didn't have enough armor. They didn't have enough training. And they didn't have especially enough mine clearing equipment. Those things doomed it. It, it was almost impossible to even think that they're going to succeed. And yet some people continue to hope that was the case. Those things still exist today. As a matter of fact, as time is going on, the advantages on the Russian side are continuing to increase. So even though Ukraine has indeed scratched out a five kilometer front across the Dnipro River, they can't do anything with it because the minute that they start trying to ferry across the river, not boatloads of, of troopers and individual infantrymen, but if they try to move across large numbers of armored vehicles, they simply won't be able to advance with them for the exact same reasons they didn't do it in the Zaporizhia front. So this is, I, I don't know if they're trying to just keep people's motivation up or the morale or what they're trying to do, but in terms of tactical utility, it's not going to do anything at all. Now, another, another thing I want to point to that, that kind of illustrates this uh, is the uh, Avdivka area. No, I'm sorry, is the Robotan area. We'll get to Avdivka in just a minute. On August the 28th, uh, Robotina in the Zaporizhia area fell to the Ukrainian side. It was their first, and, and as it turned out to be their last, uh, you can't even call it a major victory, but it was a, a, a tactical success because it was one uh, contested city that they were able to, victor, uh, to, to get victory in. That was August 28th. Now it's November 27th. So almost exactly three months later, here is a, 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 a tactical update uh, from one of the, the best uh, uh, daily updates that's actually on the internet of any language anywhere. This was from earlier today on the exact same city. Some sources have calculated already estimated Ukrainian losses just for battle for the western flank. Uh, currently I'm talking about uh, these, uh, let's say, these few three lines. And according to uh, open source intelligence, open source uh, pictures and geolocations we have, the Ukrainians uh, during the, uh, let's say, the West, uh, Western robots in the flank battle lost around 26 armored vehicles, tanks, including tanks and just personal carriers and many, many other types of weapon. So significant number just for another 500 meters. And I'm not saying that this is the Ukrainians uh, are not, don't know how to fight. This is the, this is the current situation. This is the, the site. This is the thing that we will remember. Remember this war, uh, special military operation in years that uh, the tank attacks, armored vehicles attacks always ended with one thing, with significant number of, uh, of losses among the armored vehicles. Currently, neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians have created something new, how to attack, how to penetrate the defense belts and how to reduce the losses. Now, you see, the, that, that was from actually yesterday, but you see it's the exact same city for three months. 
the Ukraine and the Russian side have been fighting and dying over no exchange of territory at all. They just keep killing each other and slogging into there, but the front line, front line hasn't changed at all. Now, one area that might be changing uh, to the detriment of the Ukraine side is Avdivka. You may have heard that term, uh, that city name used in the, in the reports recently uh, across the news uh, because it is something that Ukraine has held since 2014. Uh, and, and actually Russia earlier this year tried to storm it and it had a disastrous failure uh, lost you know, hundreds, if not thousands of troops and, and, and many scores of armored vehicles and, and didn't gain anything at all. Now then they're renewing this attack and things are turning out a little differently this time. A small city has become one of the biggest battles in Russia's war in Ukraine. Moscow has sent tens of thousands of troops to Avdivka in the eastern Donetsk region. But Ukraine says many of those men have been killed on the battlefield in what's looking like a repeat of the deadly fight for Bakhmut earlier this year. There's not really anything left of Avdivka, and that's the same as Bakhmut was. Here's why Russia is determined to take Avdivka, no matter the cost. Capturing Avdivka would allow Russia to tighten its grip on the Donetsk region. The city is located just over 30 miles south of Bakhmut. But Evdivka is more significant to Moscow because it is close to Donetsk City, which has been held by Russia since 2014. Seizing Evdivka would allow Putin to claim that the momentum in the war is back with Moscow. Putin, after the initial failure to take Kiev, announced that taking the Donetsk and Luhansk regions was the priorities, and symbolically it would show that they're still moving forward. Russia is pouring large numbers of troops into its assault on Evdivka, just like in Bakhmut earlier this year. And also, as in Bakhmut, Ukraine says this has cost Moscow thousands of men and dozens of armoured vehicles, yet they've hardly advanced. For the Russians, a war of attrition favours that. A high casualty war of attrition favours that. And they've been more willing to just throw bodies at an area to try to take it than Ukraine has. Kiev was criticised for its decision to defend Bakhmut rather than retreat, with critics saying Ukraine had taken too many casualties. I wouldn't be surprised if Ukrainians are more willing to give up Avdivka. I don't know that, that they're going to be so willing to throw so many men at it as they were with Bakhmut. The, the issue with Bakhmut that was mentioned there uh, toward the end was a big city earlier this year where uh, the Wagner Group uh, was basically going on a long, it turned out to be nine-month assault that just slowly, just inch by inch, day by day, just methodically reduced the city. And I, I had been arguing as, as far back as December of last year and certainly into January of this year that Ukraine would have been far better militarily to have withdrawn from the city and moved back to the next prepared defensive line from which they could be much more successful in preventing the Russia from going further, and they would have saved literally tens of thousands of troops. Uh, but they chose not to do that. And instead, they lost many, many thousands of troops, both killed and wounded, that were supposed to have been used for their offensive. So that undercutted their chances even later on to go. Now then, there's an issue whether they're going to do the same thing here in Avdivka or not. There's apparently, according to many of the Ukrainian telegram channels, there is a fierce debate uh, in the, the, the Kiev and the headquarters between President Zelensky and the commander of the armed forces, Zeluzhny, about what they should do. Apparently, Zeluzhny says, recognizes militarily that there's no often, there's no value to keep an Avdivka, but there is value in creating a more defensive line to buy time for the future. Zelensky, apparently, according to these reports, is saying, no, we're going to continue to hold that city and we're, we're going to get ready to go on the offensive. Now, that sets up a big dilemma because it's the, Ukraine has definitely got limitations on its on its personnel. Already, they're now expanding the the mobilization uh, uh, group of people to 18 year olds. They've now dropped it all the way down to 18. I think it started at 25 years old. They have lost so many people now that, again, according to Ukrainian telegram channels, the number of people they're losing per month is greater than the number of people they're bringing in. So they're having to expand that group. But you you understand that Russia has three to four times, maybe five times the number of military age males from which to draw. If this gets into a war of attrition, if it stays there, because that's basically where it is right now, that definitely favors Russia over time. 
Now, this rift has had a, a, an, an even bigger problem uh, politically within Ukraine. It's not gotten hardly any news here in the, in the United States. But there was a member of the Ukrainian parliament uh, a few days back that actually publicly said that Zeluzhny needs to be resigned. He needs to be fired or he needs to resign because they say the claim was he doesn't even have a plan for 2024. He has no offensive plan, so he doesn't even have a plan. Zelensky wants to go on the offensive again in the spring. He wants a new offensive to, to retake the territory. Zeluzhny doesn't have one. He should be fired. Now, uh, that's causing obviously lots of problems in the military because they see their political head and their military head are clashing in public. And of course, this has been going on for weeks now when Zeluzhny first uh, gave a, a, an exclusive interview to The Economist where he ex you know, revealed that the offensive didn't succeed this summer and that they need to try to rebuild their strength and they needed a bunch of weapons and other things from the West which Zelensky doesn't, didn't like and has you know, taken the public censure to him there. So that can only have a negative impact on the troops wondering what's going on back in Kiev, you know, who's actually running the show here and what does that say for the future of, of our side? Now, things continue to get worse when you start examining the fundamentals that are under this. Now, the reason that I came out emphatically before this offensive began last June was because the military fundamentals were simply not in place to allow a Ukraine victory. It was self-evident. If you know anything about military affairs, military art, and military history, it was clear that there was no foundation for a Ukrainian victory. And if that was true then, it's even more true today. And the reasons are now continuing to escalate in Russia's favor. Now, this is not to suggest necessarily that the war is going to be over you know, at the end of the year or the beginning of next year, because it could drag on quite a bit longer. But folks, there is no path by which Ukraine can militarily win this war. The longer they ignore that and continue to try to push forward in different places and to, to ignore that, that military fundamental reality, the more people they're going to get killed, the more of the future of Ukraine that they desperately need once this war is over, these, especially these military age males, are going to need them. They're going to continue to sacrifice them to no gain. They're going to continue to lose cities like Abdivka and other ones. Russia is also losing huge numbers of people. No one's disputing that. Even the Russians aren't disputing that. But the Russians have more to submit or to, to, uh, to give away and to lose. They can fight a war of attrition and win in time. Now, there's a report also out, I believe it's today, in the Wall Street Journal where they're, they're talking about how Putin actually is on the uptake. Uh, he's on the increase because what they have done is they have completely mobilized their uh, civilian industry for wartime. They have gone some of their manufacturing away from uh, civilian manufacturing into military manufacturing. That means that they're creating more artillery shells, more drones. Uh, more of their own uh, armored vehicles are being refurbished or built from scratch. To airframes, helicopters, jets, they continue to build these things. The, the Ukraine side can never match that. And you see here, even in the United States, there's a lot of political issues going on between the Republicans and the Democrats, between the House and the Senate, b between the, the president and the Congress about funding for Ukraine with the issues of, of the, uh, uh, the war in Israel, of course, adding even more fuel to that because we simply don't have enough fuel uh, funds. We don't have enough ammunition to continue to do everything that both sides want. So there's going to have to be choices made. And so far in the, the in September and then again earlier this month, when there was a continuing resolution passed, had no money for Ukraine. They're going to try again next month to do that in, in January. Who knows if they're going to succeed, but they, it's almost certainly not going to be as much. The European Union has said that they were going to give a million artillery shells by March to Ukraine side. They won't be a fraction of that because they're having a hard time actually making that manufacturing up. Russia's not having that problem. They are because it's an existential issue for them. They have it all self-contained. They don't have to rely on any other country, any other political issues like Ukraine does. Everywhere you want to look at this, the personnel, the, the logistics of war, the, the ability to sustain the political will, all of these things are in Russia's favor. Now, many in the West will say, hey, we'll just keep giving them the Ukraine side as much as we can, and that'll keep a stalemate going. And over time, then somehow that'll wear Russia down. 
That's a bad gamble because that assumes that the Ukraine side will continue to fight and they will continue to be able to fight. But from a military perspective, from a from a trooper perspective, there is a limit to how far you can go. Now, to to date, the Ukraines have, have been, you know, legion in their you know, courage and their willingness to suffer and their willingness to fight against, you know, unbelievable odds. Their patriotism is it's off the charts. It's it's admirable by any measure. But that only goes so far. That can't win wars by itself. It can be decisive if the other factors are close to being similar. But when the other factors are way out of balance, all that does is continue to get more people killed, more cities lost, more territory lost. Ukraine can't afford that. The wise thing to do right now is to recognize ground truth, combat reality, that the chances of a Ukraine victory are almost non-existent. But the probability of, of loss over time is great. Now, why should Ukraine wait until the, the, the end can't be helped, until maybe there's a literal collapse, a physical collapse of the army in the field? And that certainly can happen. It's impossible to predict if, when, or to what degree. But historically, it very much is on the table. And there's a greater chance of that than that this, the stalemate would be maintained. Let's don't wait for that moment. Let's do whatever we can to help Ukraine negotiate some kind of an end that will at least retain as much territory as they have right now, the political independence of Kiev, and the ability to flourish into the future, to make defense agreements, to make economic impacts with the West, all, all kinds of other countries that are willing and, and grateful and would be happy to continue to supporting Ukraine into the future. But we've got to get that war stopped. If we don't, if the Ukraine side says no, we're going to doggedly continue to, you know, take the advantage of our of our courage, of our men, and our willingness to fight and suffer. They may end up losing even more, and then at some point could be compelled to make a negotiated settlement on terms that that Moscow dictates. That should be avoided at all costs. It can be avoided by doing the right, wise thing now, however politically unpopular it is. It's the best chance Ukraine has. And I hope they take it. That's all we have for you right now. That's going to continue to be a dynamic situation, of course. And we're going to continue following it here at Deep Dive and giving you the information that you need so that you know and you can make sense of the world around you. We're going to remain unintimidated and uncompromising, giving you the truth, even when it's ugly, even when it's not something that we would like to hear. But uh, that's what we have for you. Now, I also would like to remind you that at three o'clock today, uh, we have Holly McKay going to be on live with us. Uh, it's a great war uh, war correspondent. She's been all over the world. It's going to be an amazing show. I hope you join us for that. And we will see you next time on Deep Dive.